what, what's interesting about this in, in my talk, and, and I appreciate the introduction, is, is I was introduced to the Office of Risk Management Analysis. I lead a division responsible for risk governance and, dis and support within the Department of Homeland Security within the Office of Risk Management and Analysis. The other division, which uh, my colleague Deborah Elkins will be speaking from later this afternoon, but the other division is called Risk Analytics. So you would think, given the theme of this conference, that perhaps you want to hear, instead, not from me, but from my colleague who leads the division called Risk Analytics. But I think the reason that Deborah asked me to be here and, and work with the IBM and the Maryland folks was because my responsibility is to take the risk analytics that are being produced by other people that you'll be hearing about types of risk analytics produced in a lot of different fora throughout the day. But my responsibility is to build the structures to take the risk analytics and make them useful to department decision making. So, so it's sort of as a contextualizing, of, of, as you listen to me talk, I don't do analytics. I appreciate the need for analytics. I advocate for analytics passionately. I try to help people create the capability to do analytics. But our job is to make sure that when the analytics are created, the risk analytics for the department, which can be called business analytics for department, that there are the mechanisms in place to use them with, for the Department of Homeland Security. And so what I'm going to be doing, and I, I hope it's an appropriate way to sort of kick off the day, is contextualize the need for risk analytics and business analytics in the Department of Homeland Security, talk about how we're building the processes and the structure so that we can better use them. And then um, the rest of the day, I suspect you're going to be hearing more detailed types of things about models for the Department of Homeland Security, but also for across a broad range of, of policy and business areas. So, so hopefully that makes sense to you all, and I'm happy to take questions along those lines. Um, so first slide. So, so let me also start by um, grounding you at risk management at DHS, be, because it's an interesting, the department has an interesting role with risk management. We are, and we say we are, and Homeland Security is a risk management mission. So the reason we are in business is to manage the risk that the nation faces from the, um, potential terrorist attacks, from natural disasters, from cyber incidents, from border violations, from the potential pandemic incidents, those sorts of things. So we, we exist to manage risk. Uh, um, you, you'll hear, when you hear about risk management in the business sense, often risk management isn't the reason you exist, it's something that you do so that you can accomplish your strategy. The Department of Homeland Security has to manage risk so that it can accomplish its strategy. Certainly, we care about our reputational risk and we care about whether we're able to hire the right people, our human capital risk, and, and whether our acquisitions work and whether they come in under cost on schedule and things like that. But even more than that, we care about that because we ultimately want to achieve risk management for the nation. We, we want security to go up because risk has gone down. And, and so when I talk about risk management, I'm talking about it as our strategic purpose for existence. That, and, and risk management is the structured way that we use to frame security trade-offs. So, so when we're making decisions, we're making decisions on which, which approach we think will do a better job of reducing the risk that the nation faces. Um, the types of decisions we make are, are investing in countermeasures, and I'll, I'll talk a little more about what sort of countermeasures the Department of Homeland Security has at its exposure. Um, we can certainly place guards places. So that, that's what we decide to do at, at, at airports, certainly, that, that there are TR, TSA officials who, who sort of guard entrance into the, um, onto the plane, border guards, certainly like that. We also do other sorts of operations, um, Secret Service, the United States Coast Guard. These are very operational arms. That's one way that we manage risk. But, but that's not the only way that we manage risk. We also, in some areas, we do regulation. For example, the chemical sector. We, we have a regula regulatory framework that must be followed to secure chemical facilities. And our only job is to enforce the regulations. In other areas, other sectors, the electricity sector, that, that's not a Department of Homeland Security security regulated sector. Instead, what we do in the electricity sector is we build partnerships, we, we provide information, we, we help promote standards that, that are in place. We show that so that the, the electricity sector is protected, and, and that's both from the physical and cybersecurity. Those are the types of things we give grants. Um, so so around, around critical infrastructure facilities, we give grants to protect buffer zone, to provide buffer zone protection and things like that. So those are the kind of risk management solutions that the Department of Homeland Security has at, at, at its um, fingertips, I guess, working with Congress and the White House and things like that. And, and again, risk management, as I was saying, it's a key business process that informs all of our planning, strategy, operational decisions, and it's, it's intended to provide metrics and ideas on how secure prepared we are, how secure prepared do we need to be, and how do you prioritize efforts to close the gap. So I'll be talking about some of that throughout the context of my conversation. So I wanted to start with um, a, a little, again, a little more background on the Homeland Security mission. 
Um, I, I've mentioned the, the, the kind of things that the Department of Homeland Security exists to reduce the risk to, to manage the risk to, to prevent from happening. Um, we, we obviously have different risk thresholds for, for things like terrorist attacks, cyber attacks, uh, Hurricane Katrina flooding, tropical storms. I, I mean, obviously with tropical storms, they're going to happen and, and the risk management that we do is, is making sure we're prepared to deal with the consequences of them. With terrorist attacks, our risk management strategy focused first and foremost for keeping those from happening. With cyber attacks, they happen. Our risk management strategy keeps working with the private sector and the owners of the cyber systems to contain the things that happen, to understand what happens, to make sure that, that the interdependencies that can happen with a, an attack on a cyber system don't sort of overwhelm us. So, so we have different risk management, risk tolerances, and we have different risk management approaches for, for these, sorts of, um, these sorts of incidents. Uh, and, and similarly, just like we have different risk tolerances, we have different aims. And the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review, and, and I'm sorry, I should have contextualized that a little bit. Uh, the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review was something that we did as a department on behalf of the nation in the administration in 2009, and it was, it was to do a check on where we were in terms of homeland security, what progress we had made, what should our focus should be, what should our strategic missions be to deal with the sorts of risks that I'm going to talk about. And so it, it, it was an attempt to replicate what the Defense Department has done um, several times since 1993 at Quadrennial Defense Review and to take a moment and pause and say, are we focused on the right things for Homeland Security? Are, are, is, is our strategy the right, the right thing? As you know, um, after 9-11, you know, we ran very fast to build a whole new apparatus to protect this country, including the department, which um, just, just this week celebrated its eighth anniversary. And, in that stage, there was um, all the challenges that you read about in the newspaper in terms of, and all that you can imagine in terms of standing up a massive organization of, you know, this, I think it's the second biggest federal organization behind the Department of Defense. Maybe it's roughly the same size as the Department of Veterans Affairs. But, but um, to stand all those up and at the same time do the kinds of things that, that you know, uh, respond aggressively to the challenges that we, we believe threaten the homeland. Um, we, we, we've had the ability in, in, in those eight years to learn some lessons and we've, we've had the ability to um, see sort of what the threat environment, have an evolving thoughts of, of what the threat environment looks like. And so the Quadrennial Homeland Security Review was a chance to pause and, and look at where we were strategically while continuing to operate, of course. Um, so the QHSR identified three goals. Risk management, as you know, is, is something that should be the, the risks that you care about are the risks that threaten your goals, whether you're the Department of Homeland Security or whether you're a Fortune 500 company or a small company. The goals that we care about in the Department of Homeland Security are, are to provide security, to provide resilience, because we know, as the Secretary and others have said many times, we're not, unfortunately, going to stop every bad thing that could happen, but, but we can't let those bad things happen knock us too far off our feet as a nation, we would argue. So resilience is a key concept in the Department of Homeland Security that, that we have to have the ability to bounce back, to, to take what happens and to bounce back without letting it completely change the American way of life. So balance, security, and resilience, and then customs and exchange is the catch-all for the fact that we want to enable the supply chains. We want to enable the, movement, the legal movement of people and goods in an effective, efficient way and have all the security that we need to provide into that supply chain and the, the legal moves, movement of people and goods and, and information through the cyber networks. We want to have all that happen as effectively and efficiently and not let security or resilience, the need for those two things to somehow ha have two negative effects on our customs and exchange. And, and so risk management, a, as we talk about making risk-based decisions, we are balancing these three goals and, and that's why we have different approaches to different hazards and things like that. So, so one of the outcomes of the QHSR and perhaps the primary outcome was to sort of divide the work that Homeland Security does into five missions. Um, so what, what you see in the top in the traditional responsibilities is this is stuff that we've been doing long before 9-11 and long before the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. This is stuff that the American government has been judged to, to be a responsibility of the American government, maritime security, aviation security, land border security, leadership protection, trade facilitation, all those sort of things. So it's not like Homeland Security started when we created the Department of Homeland Security. We've been doing things to secure the homeland and to balance security and customs and exchange for a long time. Um, what, what has changed 
in the opinion of the leaders of the department and the administration and, and others, is that we do have new threats and evolving hazards that make it necessary to operate differently, to put more attention to this problem, to create things like the Department of Homeland Security. And, and, and those, uh, again, are things that you're familiar with, weapons of mass destruction. Unfortunately, there is more potential for the use of weapons of mass destruction from a non-state actor than there ever has been before. And you know the technology trends and the science and the sort of collapse of certain nation states in the, uh, the different security framework in the international space means that we have to be concerned about bad people getting their hands on, on bad materials. And, and so that's one concern. Global terrorism, whether it be using weapons of mass destruction or not, is something that we've seen a bump in trend in global terrorism, not just in, in interest in doing that in the United States, but in general, the, the trends are higher. Cyber attacks, um, you, you're all familiar. Cyberspace didn't exist in some sense 20 years ago. Yeah, 20 years ago, why not? Um, maybe 30 years ago in some spaces. The IBM folks can correct me. Um, but it, it certainly did not dominate the way that not only we do, we do business in the office, all of us who sit in front of computers, but those of us who don't sit, or th those people who don't sit in front of computers who are out doing jobs, creating things, are still relying on cyberspace. And so obviously there's new, new threats there, pandemics, natural disasters, you know, the reality of global ch climate change, the reality of, of sort of flow of people across countries and, and, and the change in weather and health patterns means that, that we think there's something going on in terms of pandemics and natural disasters um, that make them perhaps more uncertainty than just looking at historical patterns illegal trafficking or related transnational crime and smaller scale terrorism. So those were the threats and hazards that, that the QHSR identified that we really had to be concerned about from a risk management perspective. So, so our, our work is organized into five mission areas, mm -hmm. preventing terrorism, enhancing secu security, security and managing our border, enforcing our immigration laws, safeguarding and securing cyberspace and ensuring resilience to disaster. And so, so when I talk about risk management and trade-offs, it is in with the con within the context, with across those missions, within those missions, against the types of new threats and evolving hazards that, that were laid out. Um, so, so shifting focus from the QHSR to risk management, let, let me start with a quote from the QHSR, and then I'll stop talking about the QHSR and start, talk start talking about risk management. Ultimately, Homeland Security is about effectively managing risk to the nation's security. So, so how does risk management, why, so, so that's what I was saying earlier, and how does risk management help us do it? Uh, I would argue that it helps us contextualize homeland security threats, showing which are the most likely and have the most impact. Um, that's an analytic and modeling challenge, and, and we'll talk about some ways that we do that at DHS and, and some of the challenges with doing that. But we do believe that you can prioritize the risks we face um, ba based on analysis, and you can also prioritize the effectiveness of the security measures we take in place related to those risks based, based on analysis. Um, risk management for homeland security, and, and that's what I'm saying, informs prioritization decisions of capabilities to manage risk to terrorism and, and all the other risks that I talked about. So it's not just about how do risks compare to each other, it's about when, when I make a decision whether to, to, whether to consider regulation versus using grants, versus setting standards, versus sort of just sharing information, versus providing operational security, I'm doing that with an uh, understanding of what's the risk management effect of, of doing so and what are the trade-offs in terms of um, security outcomes from those different solutions. That's not, just, that's not the only input into those decisions, that, but, but in some ways that's the benefit equation of the cost-benefit equation. How much risk do we think we're going to reduce? And then you've got to consider the costs associated with that as well. Um, so that leads to measuring performance of programs across the Homeland Security mission space. So not only, risk, risk can be thought of as sort of a heuristic for thinking about security problems, but more than that, once you start doing the modeling and analysis, you can actually start to see, have we, you, you can do performance related to have we reduced risk, have we reduced the likelihood of things happening, have we re reduced the consequences if they do happen. And so you do that all for the decisions of helping the decision maker identify opportunities for reducing or transferring risk. So, so, so that's the reason that my office exists. Um, that's where we are in terms of the Department of Homeland Security with risk management. Um, what we're trying to do then is build a program, a program called Integrated Risk Management within DHS to allow us to, uh, I hate using the word bureaucratize, but maybe it's institutionalize <laughs> the, the processes within a bureaucracy. Um, because that's how, that's how you make decisions in a large organization. You, you have to routinize, you have to bureaucratize it. So um, 
this is sort of our bureaucratic solution to being able to use risk analysis to support decision making. And then I'm going to end with some conversation about particular types of risk analysis we do and some challenges associated with that. So the, the Secretary has called for us to incorporate a standardized risk management process in the, into the overall mission and management of DHS. Um, again, risk management at the department is not different than strategic management at the department. It is the same thing. That my office supports strategic planning. It supports resource allocation. We don't make decisions ourselves. Instead, we build processes and analysis so that we can support those decisions, operational planning. Um, we should use risk in information analysis to inform decision making, not based risk. Our decision making won't be based on risk information analysis. It's too complex in the analysis. There's too much uncertainty associated to it. But it has to be a key information source across the whole sphere of decisions we make. And in doing so, we have to acknowledge that the world's changing and evolving at a fast point, pace. And, and so while we're informed by analysis, we have to allow ourselves to maintain flexibility for new information and, and new risks that emerge. Um, we need to develop methodologies to determine how well DHS programs and activities manage risk. And we need to do this as, in a unified um, way with our partners in, in the in our partners in the private sector, our partners at state and local government, our partners in academia and in the NGOs. We have to work together on this problem. One of, the, one of the key things that came out of the QHSR is the re realization that the Department of Homeland Security can't, can't create Homeland Security by itself. And in fact, when you hear this, the Secretary talk about things like see something and say something in, in the key initiative that we put into empowering people and, and communities to be more resilient and people to be part of the Homeland Security apparatus. Part of that is with the acknowledgement that security is, is the, the, the department's job is sort of to do parts of it, but, but to work with their partners to, to develop a risk management of, um, frame. So that, that's what the Secretary has asked us to do. We have established a standard risk management process and a definition for risk management, which is part of our overall DHS risk lexicon, which we published in 2008 and 2010. So, so we've defined key terms in Homeland Security risk management. The only one I, I leave you is the, our definition of risk management. And this is our standard risk management process that, that we have made it the policy of the department to put this process into decision making at the DHS headquarters strategic and operational planning level, at the resource allocation level, but also within the components of DHS. So we've asked the Coast Guard and, and TSA and, and Customs and Border Protection to use this sort of risk, inform, risk management framework to make decisions and, and to inform their business processes. It's not a particularly different than risk management circles or processes that I'm sure you've seen other places from places like the IRGC, International Risk Governance Council, places like the GAO has a risk management cycle. But, but it, it's a standard way of approaching the problems, and it's been helpful to, to use that. Um, here are some of the decisions that we use that risk management process against, informing programming trade-off decisions, allocating grant funds to build preparedness capabilities, comparing risks to type of critical infrastructure assets and sectors, priorities for maritime security efforts, aviation security countermeasures, special event security priorities, and mitigation efforts for natural disasters. So we're using that risk management cycle. We're bringing analysis to bear on each of these problems. Um, so let me talk a little bit about a couple of the efforts. So, so let's start with the big one, which is something that our office does. The Department of Homeland Security gives 45 billion, Congress gives $45 billion. So let, let me get my constitution right. Congress appropriates $45 billion, some years, um, to the Department of Homeland Security. Um, <laughs> how do we decide how to trade off and, and use that? Um, our office, uh, and this is, a, this is a case of something where we're using risk analysis for that problem. Our office has worked with um, the CFO of the department, the head of strategic plans of the department, the assistant secretary for policy, to provide the deputy secretary and the secretary with a tool that takes a look at 12, 12 incident sets that the department faces. The, the tool is called the Risk Assessment Process for Informed Decision Making, or RAPID. Um, and, and what we do with that is we use a probabilistic risk assessment framework to um, look across the incident chain, how incidents might happen. So, so if, if you're looking at an IED type attack on a plane, from the guy who wakes up somewhere and wants to do damage using an IED to whether he has to come into the country, how he's going to get in the country, whether it's going to be legally or illegally, if it's 
legally is it, if it's illegally is it air land or sea how's he going to try to get in the country how's he going is he going to bring material in or is the material already here in the country i mean you can imagine it different for different sorts of weapons weapon types and, and different for drugs and, and things like that but we do use a pra type structure to work with the intel community and our security community to understand the likelihood of pre the preferences of the adversary if he's trying to do damage to us within this country. And then, uh, while understanding his preferences, we need to understand the effectiveness of our programs um, at each stage of the incident chain. So, so the PRA both looks at sort of the intel community's judgment of the preferences, including uncertainties of the way that somebody would act against the country, but then we evaluate our programs, the way we spend money, how likely are we to intercede against that, to that person who is acting this way, and if we do intercede, how likely are we going to be effective in, in stopping him from doing so, and if something happens, do we have programs that will mitigate the consequences? And, and so using an IED type thing, if, if somebody's trying to do something on an airplane, how likely is the Federal Air Marshal, how likely is the Federal Air Marshal going to be to be on that plane and if they're on the plane, will they stop it from happening? And, and so by putting a PRA structure in place, by, by getting probabilities, working with the intel community, by making judgments of the effectiveness of programs, both in terms of if they're there, how likely would they su to succeed, and how likely are they to be there, we can sort of create a, a, a model which tells us something about the comparative risk of these things and our comparative ability and the value of our programs in sort of reducing those risks. The, the, that's sort of a basic framework for using analytics for resource allocation purposes. From their point, it, it's not enough to sort of, first of all, as you can imagine, there's a lot of uncertainty in some of the challenges I'll be talking about it make it hard to execute a model like that. And it's not enough just to know that information. It's, it's then you, you need to run sort of the cost benefits of if you invest more, how much better are you going to get? If, if you invest less, how much risk are we going to take on because of that? But, but this model, this rapid model, what it allows us to do is use a PRA technique to have the basic framework in place to then do more, more detailed analysis be, by, behind the programming and, and resource decisions that the Secretary and the Deputy Secretary of Homeland Security are considering making. And, and so it's an interesting way to use risk analysis to inform DHS budgeting. Um, we're about three years into the process of developing the model. Um, it, it's, it's still got a ways to go in terms of getting everything worked out that we, we want to, but, but also I, I, I always criticize people who say it's got a ways to go, because you're never going to get a model like that perfect, as you all know. Um, you know, I think it's the George Box quote that um, all models are wrong, some models are useful. And um, we understand, and I'll talk about reasons that we understand that the model will always be wrong in some sense, but we still think it's useful and, and we're designing it to make it more relevant and more useful to the leaders of the department. Um, I, I could give you more detail of models for, for some of these other problems, and, and our office certainly doesn't work on all of these. Um, we, we rely on the components, and the components work with private sector organizations, academia, models like this. So if you have any questions of any of these particular models, I'm happy to talk to you. But those are examples of different models. So, so we're applying different, we're, we're applying basic risk thinking. Risk is the likelihood of consequence. There's a standard risk management cycle. There's standard risk management doctrine and definition. We're applying that thinking, but the models that we're using and in, in the decision support that we're providing those problems can't all be done using the same one single model. And so I want to make clear that we have no aspiration to provide the same type of risk analysis exactly to all those problems that were on the previous slide. Instead, we wanted them to be sort of consistent at a doctrinal standard level. We want higher levels of quality. We want to share the data that's involved. We want people speaking the same language through lexicon, through a common lexicon. We want to move toward data integration. And that's what integrated risk management really is within the department. It isn't getting us to one single way to do risk analysis. Instead, it's getting us to do risk analysis in a consistent way and to share the information so that when there's a crossover into mission space when we have to work together, the information is complementary and the decision maker doesn't have to look at six completely disparate models that, that are all over the place, but instead they can be boxed a little closer and it, it's a little easier to look at different things to make trade-offs. Um, so, so this slide talks about some of the challenges with doing that. Uh, some are, are certainly governance challenges, and that's what I spend a lot of my time on. The decision environment, there's a lot of diversity of stakeholders. Organizations have varied authorities and responsibilities, multiple perspectives on risk assessment priorities for risk management. That happens in any large organization, as you can imagine, and it certainly happens within DHS. 
the breadth of mission space and the type of risk analysis you do for different problems, it's not clear that the best way to analyze risk for something that happens every day, cyber type incidents, is the same thing for low probability, high consequence events. Um, again, hopefully, you know, PRA and probabilities give you a way to think about that. But, but again, it, it, you don't necessarily need to use a PRA for every problem that you're facing. And some problems do better against PRAs than other problems do. Um, there's information sharing difficulties in a large organization, lack of common risk management language policy and, and governance bodies. That's what we're working to correct. Um, the uncertainties in Homeland Security are, are both uh, epistemic, epistemic and aleatory, I guess. Uh, pardon me. Um, an inability to get that word out. Um, and part of that comes from we'll never know what the, the adversaries, how the adversary is going to react to what we do. We'll never fully know their preferences. We work with the intel community to understand their best assessment based on the information they've seen. Um, we work with modeling techniques and we're exploring sort of adaptive, uh, different ways to do adaptive adversary modeling based on games, game theory type concepts and, and, and dynamic give and take places so that we can sort of better sort of game out how, how adversaries might react to what we're doing. But we acknowledge that they're not rational actors, we're not rational actors, and, and so um, it, it's, a, it's a difficult problem. The other thing is the complex interdependencies. So the likelihood problem is made more difficult by the fact that it, it's, it's not a game against nature, it's a game, a game against man, and the, um, the consequence problem is really made difficult because of the interdependencies question. Thinking again about cyber attacks and, you know, what, are, what happens if a system goes down? How far does the system flow? How does the system start to translate into the physical space? What does that mean? And those sorts of, of, of interdependencies, in, they're similar things when, when critical nodes perhaps go down for other reasons than, than cyber attacks that, that are hard to understand and society is a complex interdependent place. And, and so it's not like we can make, the consequences of things happen that are certain. And some of the consequences we care about are, are things that are harder to quantify than loss of life and, and potential direct economic damage. There are indirect effects, there, there are psychological effects, there, there affects our ability to execute the mission. And, and we're trying to understand all those consequences because we think at a national level, that's the decision space that the Secretary of Homeland Security and, and the Cabinet and the National Security Staff Homeland Security, but that's the decision space that they really operate in. It, it's not just what, what directly happens, but, but it's the, the after effects around directly happens. And so we're trying to understand that better in terms of consequences. Um, the, the National Academies of Science, Nas or the National Research Council and National Academies of Science um, did, a, did a study of the department's approach to risk analysis and, and, and sort of evaluated where we were. Our office funded that work. It, it was published last September. Um, so if, if any of you are interested in that, um, I co commend you to the National Academies site. Um, it's fair to say that they think we have some work to do to get better at using risk analysis to support decision making. Um, they, they looked at six of our models closely and, and they found some things they liked, particularly around our natural disaster modeling, and they found some things that they, they urge us to continue to invest in. Um, perhaps PRA is not the best way for dealing with the adaptive adversary problem. Um, we agree with the perhaps it's not the best way. We're not ready to scrap the idea that PRA, which is a technique that's been used and there's a, a decent amount of literature on, we're not ready to scrap the idea that it's not at least one way to look at this problem. So we'll continue to invest in, in, in using PRA techniques, but we also are investing in alternative techniques. So anyway, the NAS identified 10 in things that we now call improvement priorities that are, the, and this goes to the analysis challenge. I mean, these are the things that make Homeland Security risk analysis difficult, even if we execute well bureaucratically. I mean, increased data availability, reliability, expanding modeling of intelligent adaptive adversaries, things like that. So, so instead of reading you this list of 10, I'll just put it up there and, and let you know that it's available and we've used it as a charge. And, and some of the themes that you've heard me talk through is we are, we, we've used this as a charge of prior, to inform our prioritization as a risk analysis department to where to get better, and we're doing that through human capital development, hiring and training, research and development, you know, through, through our Office of Science and Technology and other parts of DHS. We're actually putting money out to have smarter people than we have within the Department of Homeland Security, or people at least with more time, study these problems and, and look at new solutions. Um, guideline and policy, that's some of what I've talked about, tools and applications and partnership development. So, so 
we, we think there are a lot of different ways. It's not just a DHS challenge. It, we're not going to solve all these things. Again, solve might not be the right word. We're not going to make progress on all these things by ourselves, but we are trying to systematically across the department focus on improvement efforts against these 10 different challenges in, in this chart just sort of maps some of the where those improvement efforts are against the challenges. Um, so I, I think that's pretty much it. I, I think I've left you with some perspective of how we're using risk management, some of the challenges, I hope I've left you at least, some of the challenges with risk analysis and homeland security. Um, our, our risk management strategy ultimately is to work in a unified manner with our partners, focus on a systems-wide approach to security, resiliency matters a lot, take a layered approach to security, and adopt a flexible and adaptable approach to managing risk. Again, it, it's all getting better, faster, and, and redundant and robust and resilient against the fact that we know that the world is a complex place and problems are coming to us from a long way. Analysis enables us to do that. Um, and, and that's really the charge that for a community like this. The more information we have, the more, the more quickly that we can operate the information, the more that we can share it, the more that we can translate it, and the information can become analysis so that we're making informed decisions. This, this problem greatly exceeds the capacity of the human brain. And, and so we, we need to bring the strengths of analysis, good methodologies, good frameworks, knowledge management systems, and things like that to bear. And we need to have the willingness to use it. And, and so that's my story. Thanks. <laughs> Sure, so we use terms like strategic foresight or, or futures analysis or alternative future scenario planning type things. Um, and, I, and I think that's crucial. Um, we sort of, in my mind, we, we've separated the risks to the, I guess let's call them the unknown knowns or the known, known unknowns. Let's go, let's go known unknowns at a certain point. And then there are the unknown unknowns, which is, I think, a little bit of what you're referring to. Um, the, 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 the U.S. government as a whole, I think that's an interesting question that, that we're trying to work on to get more foresight into the planning processes. But the techniques for doing those, I, I think, are somewhat well understood in terms of trying to, to engage with creative thinkers, trying to not get away from groupthink, tr trying to create alternative worlds where people are forced to live in a world 10 years away from them and, and take time away from their day to day. I mean, the sort of classic world at shell scenario planning type thing. The intelligence community, the NIC has published, the National Intelligence Council has published the NIC 2025, 2030, which get us in that way, get us a view of what the world could look like in 2025, 2030. Those aren't, aren't in my mind, quantitative risk problems. Those are qualitative risk problems. What are the trends drivers that might change the risk picture? Um, DHS. Parts of DHS already have put that in their strategic planning process. The Coast Guard uses Project Evergreen, which, which does that as part of their strategic planning process. FEMA is invested in a strategic foresight initiative. Um, I've been part of conversations with the intelligence community and the State Department and some outside academics about trying to more institutionalize this, I, I think, at the, either at the national security staff level or, or, or something like that. Um, I think it's important to leave time for creativity and sort of challenge conventional wisdom. I, I don't think it's that the techniques aren't known. I think it's, it's the willingness to do that. And, and I, I'm more on the, despite not being an, a day-to-day -day analyst, I'm still more on the analyst perspective than the decision maker's perspective. But you understand the difficulty that decision makers have with the, the challenge of immediacy, the political system, and all that, that they're responsible for two or three years to, to, to get focused. But I, I still think we have to create space to do so. Um, no great thoughts toward that. Um, I, I don't do much work with program acquisition. It, it's, it seems like a problem that would be a, a proper use of PRA, but I, but I don't think I have any 
real insight into the question. I don't know, Deborah, if you. Um, could you say any more about uh, low probability high consequence or colossal consequence? Sure. Um, obviously, that they exist, um, and you know, it is our argument that there's a difference between low probability one in a hundred and one in a billion, as, as we all know. That, that's a pretty significant difference. And, uh, don't force me to count the orders of magnitude, but, but um, it's worth asking whether it's a one in a hundred or one in a billion question. We're, we're not, once you get down to one in a billion, the human brain doesn't have any ability to separate one in a billion versus uh, some other things. But, but it's still worth seeing what, what we know about that. So, so I, I'm not comfortable just saying low probability is low probability. I, I'd like to know what we know about low probability, but we also acknowledge where the uncertainty exists. Um, for low probability, high consequence questions, moving away from the assessment problem to, to, to the management problem, we feel like, and FEMA's sort of leading the department's effort to plan for the maximum, maximum high catastrophe type things that could happen because we don't feel like the way is, is the department that we deal with those high, low probability, high consequence events might be just doing more standard emergency management. We, we think there's probably a need for an alternative emergency management structure if those things were sort of happening. So for example, FEMA's advocating cata catastrophic, catastrophic planning against the consequences of low probability, high consequence events without so much worry about exactly why they might happen, but, but the kind of capabilities we would need to deal with the consequences. And so we have several scenarios that we've used to create this maximum and maximum framework. This is sort of the worst case that we're going to we're going to realistically plan against right here. Here's how many beds we're going to need for that. Here's how many people we're going to have to evacuate. Here's the, the size of the uh, space. Here's the commu communications, the, the sort of situational awareness and, and communications command and control we're going to need during this situation. And so we, we've used several different potential low probability, high consequence scenarios to set up um, sort of our understanding of the magnitude of the problem. We're trying to understand do we have the capabilities to deal with the magnitude of the problem because Again, I, I think it's worth trying to study the differences between low probabilities, but I, I'm sufficiently um, wary of our ability to get it right that I think we have to assume that there are going to be high consequences of things that are going to happen that we, we can't imagine exactly why they're going to be caused. I don't know if that. One more question. Yeah. You mentioned that you used some of the analytics techniques to figure out the return on investment that you would for yeah. the budget things that you do. Do you do something similar when you're doing the preferences? Sure. Uh, I don't myself in my work, but I'm familiar with work that does it. Um, th there are different theories, right? First of all, yes. So any adaptive adversary model is based on getting their utility function, their preferences right in, in some, to some degree. Um, there seems to be, just from open source, there seems to be a fact that despite, they, they continue to have a preference to do things in the aviation system that don't necessarily map to any rational model of why that preference exists, but, but it does. Um, one of the debates is how, how much do they have, they don't have perfect information about what we do, but how much information do they have on what we do? How much does that influence them? Um, and, and sort of how quickly, how quickly do they, they sort of change approaches? Um, those sort of questions need to be considered in models. I, I mean, I don't, I, I think it's probably worth running alternative models with alternative assumptions in the adversary and seeing whether there's consistency of what we should do based on those. And, and I'm not sure what the right, right model to do it is. Um, you know, that, that's a, and the other thing is there, there's a lot that the intelligence community can do to glean their stated preferences. I mean, there's certainly, we, we live in an information rich environment, their stated preferences are pretty much out there, whether they act on their stated preferences or not. Um, those are all, that, that makes modeling the, the adversary a tough question. All right, one more, one last one. I, I was tasting your uh, like to see some short uh, uh, sleeve analysis of uh, your perspective, your perspective on this. Okay, we, we screen everybody coming into uh, an airport gate, right? Mm -hmm. You line up and have your get x rays and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's universal. No, mm -hmm. no, no needles mm -hmm. get through the haystack to get, it, get inside. But at the same time, of course, you create a huge clot of people mm -hmm. on the other side of the security perimeter, mm -hmm. totally unscreened, well, not totally unscreened, but mm -hmm. largely, certainly not as screened as mm -hmm. they are on the other side. Mm -hmm. Now, one would think that you've done a trade-off here. Mm -hmm. You've prevented one form of risk of people getting in to get on the plane at the gate. 
because you create another risk, there's a big fat target there. Yeah. Uh, yet, no, to my knowledge, no terrorist has, has yet tried to do a suicide bomb right at the gate there mm -hmm. uh, to, to encourage it. Okay. Russia. It's well, Russia. Well, it, 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 it has happened. Yes. So, 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 as we point out, what happened in Russia <laughs> causes us to reconsider those. You, you know, it, it's always dangerous to get up here and say you represent the Department of Homeland Security because people are going to ask you about a bunch of different things, largely what happens at the airport. Um, I, I think my position is the kind of analysis we're doing will cause us to get better at making decisions like those in the longer term. And I think that would be TSA's position that, that right now that's the best we know of how to deliver. And there's good reasons for delivering security that way. But over time, as we get better and as we start to deploy more of a risk management approach at the airport and the airport of the future, those are the types of questions as we use more technology at the airport. Those are the types of trade-offs that I, I, I hope will get to a place where we, we can make them. Per I, I don't know the analysis. Perhaps we're making the absolute right trade-off based on what we know now. I'm not ready to say we aren't. But I also understand that the more we think through innovative solutions to that, may, maybe, maybe we are creating a risk that we don't want to from that. And hopefully what the analysis does is, is that decision has to be made by politicians. It has to be made in consult with Congress. It has to be made with industry, airport association, and you know, union reps. There are a lot of different players in there. And, and if we have analysis that proves what you're saying is right, that makes it more likely to make a different decision. But there's all these other things. There's inertia to change. There's political risk and all those things. Doesn't mean we're going to necessarily change all that. But, but it does become part of the conversation. And that's sort of what we're advocating for. Okay, thank you.